Hello everyone, and welcome to a series I'm going to call History of a Hero. In this series, I will be taking one character from a comic per episode and showing you their art history through the years, showing some of the notable artists who drew the character and some of the redesigns that they have had over the character's lifetime. And I couldn't think of anywhere better to start than with my favorite character, Batman. Batman was created by artist and writer Bob Kane and co-writer Bill Finger. His first appearance was in Detective Comics number 27, which was released in 1939 and was drawn by Bob Kane himself. Before I continue though, I'd like to show you this. What we have here is Bob Kane's first design for the Batman, and as you can see, it was a little different, though the cape stayed the same. Also, you'll notice that in some ways, it is very similar to the design of how Robin would be drawn. Now, if this was intentional in Robin's design, I don't know, but I think it's a cool idea anyway. Now, Bob Kane's design gave us all the main features that we have come to know about Batman's costume. We see Batman's cape and cowl, as well as the utility belt he is so known for. One difference in Bob Kane's design was that Batman's ears resembled more how an actual bat's ears are shaped, being a bit more rounded out on the sides. His original costume was just basic cloth and leather. There was no armor. Also a fun fact, in the original Detective Comics, Batman actually carried a gun in his utility belt, which he would actually use. But, thankfully, they realized it was better for him to never use guns, as it was a gun that took his parents from him. Now, even though Bob Kane created Batman and drew him for the first time, the most notable beginnings of Batman's design comes from the run of the Batman comics drawn mainly by Dick Sprang. Now, Sprang gave us much of the classic look that we've come to know and love about Batman being a bit more bulky and square. He worked on and off for about 20 years alongside other artists and inkers at the time, though it is Sprang that has left a good mark on the character and more or less redefined how Batman would look for years to come. Now coming into the 60s, Batman had been drawn by many artists, some like Sheldon Maldoff and Jim Mooney, to name a few. But around 1964, a man named Julius Swartz began to create a new look for Batman and turned to artists Carmine Infantino to do the artwork. Infantino was already pretty well known for over 127 issues of Flash and gave us a more realistic look for Batman. You can see a lot of his work just in the covers of many issues alone and even did the cover for issue 181 which was the first appearance of Poison Ivy. He is even credited with helping the creation of Barbara Gordon's Batgirl. In the late 60s and well into the 70s, our next artist to take the mantle of Batman was none other than Neil Adams. Adams took the dark realism that started with Infantino and went to the next level. His style has been praised for years as one of the top of all time, and it's not hard to see why. Neil Adams was also credited for helping give us notable villains such as Manbat and one of Batman's arch rivals, Ra's al Ghul. He would go on to appear in around 39 Batman comics, as well as being a regular to the Detective Comics series. Now, as we push into the 80s and up, there are so many artists who have touched on the Batman comics and provided some amazing art uh, but to save time on this video being an hour long, let's move up a bit. In 1988, the editors of DC decided to do something amazing. Give the audience a chance to affect the comic world, giving us Batman issues 426 to 429, or as it has come to be called in its trade form, Batman, a death in the family. Considered in the top lists as one of the best Batman stories ever made, Death in the Family was drawn by penciler Jim Aparo and inker Mike DiCarlo, with covers drawn by my favorite artist, Mike Mignola. The artwork resembled much like how Neil Adams' art was, dark and realistic. I highly recommend picking up a cup for yourself. 
over whatever the hell DC is doing at the moment. Seriously, what the hell do you do, Joker DC? Anyway, making another quick jump around, just before Death in the Family was out, in 1986, artist and writer Frank Miller donned his cape and cowl by giving us the amazing story, Batman The Dark Knight Returns. Another of the great stories in Batman's history. Dark Knight Returns showcases some amazing artwork by Frank Miller, and giving us a new Robin, Carrie Kelly, who takes on the role after Jason Todd's death, which many believe is the inspiration that editor Dennis O'Neill had for writing Death in the Family. Around the same time as these two publications was another great book, Batman Year One. This was written again by Frank Miller, but this time drawn by David Masuchelli who gives us a more simplistic, but very dynamic and effective style to Batman. Much more clean than the greedy style of Miller, and a welcome addition to the many styles of Batman. Working our way into the 90s, artist Norm Brayfold took on as artist of Batman and gave us a much more exaggerated figure for Batman. More expression in the faces and stretched proportions led to more dynamic designs and action and gave a dark sense to the character. He also went on to do art for the Batman Beyond comic series. During the 90s, Batman was taken from the comics and given life by Tim Burton on the big screen. After great success, artist and producer Bruce Timm decided to take Batman and bring him to the small screen, giving us Batman the Animated Series. Bruce Timm's style was simplistic, streamlined, and dark. This prompted DC to begin making a comic series tie-in called Batman Adventures, which had a few artists put on who mimicked much of what Bruce Timm had done with the animated series. Some of the artists being Ty Templeton and Mike Parabek. This ran well into the new adventures of Batman, which saw a complete overhaul in the art style and would last all the way through the Superman animated series, which ran side by side, as well as later series like the Justice League and Justice League Unlimited animated series. Another artist who did some one-shots of Batman is the great Mike Mignola, who, as I've said, is one of my favorite artists of all time. Mignola's style is dark, gritty, streamlined, it's just pure amazing. He's even noted as creating the look for Mr. Freeze for the Batman animated series, and has done many great covers as well. Though he is known for his run on Hellboy, Mignola will always have his mark on Batman. Now, during the 90s and into the you know 2000s, Frank Miller started to get a bit, well, crazy, giving us some pretty horrid work, such as the completely pointless sequel, Dark Knight Strikes Again, with terrible artwork, horrible sexism, and just really stupid writing. This carried on up into when Miller began writing All-Star Batman and Robin. Thankfully, he gave the torch for artwork over to amazing artist Jim Lee. Yeah, it didn't save the comic from being an absolutely horrid and a complete waste of time, but man, did Jim Lee give us some insane artwork. His attention to details and realistic aspect mixed with dynamic shots are just a few of the amazing qualities that make Jim Lee's run on this somewhat tolerable. So long as you ignored the text. Seriously, who the frick taught Miller how to draw women? I want to know why he gets work. Right. Our final artist for this video will be the man who has been one of the main artists for the series during some of these last years. His name is Tony Danielle. And he has definitely done a great job on his run with Batman. Definitely being an artist of how modern comics are drawn and really gives a nice dark feel to the character. And that's been our look into the history of Batman. 
If I've missed or left out any artists, I'm very sorry, but there are only so many I can really fit into one video and keep it at a reasonable time frame. I've provided a link below to a huge list of all people who have been credited in working on Batman, either as a writer, an editor, or an artist. So you can see why I've had to only pick a select few here. Even though I am not all that happy with the new 52 that DC's been throwing out, I'm happy to know that I can always rely on the past amazing comics to keep me company until DC gets their heads out their asses. If you'd like to see a character's art history, then leave a comment below on who you'd like to see. And until next time, thank you for watching.